say thank you this morning to the praise team. I don't know about you, but I was blessed. I don't think of any better way to usher in a new year than to praise our God and be reminded, no matter what our situation is, that we have hope. And that hope is in a Savior. That means no matter what you're facing or what's lying ahead, all right, in the days that it will come upon you, that you know because of the Savior with you, He reigns. That means He's in control. That means He's already obtained the victory. And you can rest in Him and praise God for that. Quite a change temperature-wise, right? This weekend, I, I was wondering how even to dress. I had to remind myself that Pastor Matt wasn't going to be here because I was wondering what the thermostat was going to be set on, all right? I said, do I dare wear a sweater, all right? I, I might be too warm, but it feels pretty comfortable in here, am I right? So praise God for that. Hey, a little survey, just curiosity, all right? How many, I'm going to see if I'm in the minority or majority. How many people here stayed up last night to midnight to welcome in the new year. Well, I guess it's about 50-50, all right? I, know you, I didn't, all right? <laughs> I'm looking at Hayden. You didn't either, did you? No, okay. All right, but hey, God bless you. I, I know my wife, was. she stayed up, and she said she heard firecrackers and stuff going off. I didn't hear nothing. I was uh, sound asleep. <laughs> Praise God for that. Hey, if you would turn in your Bibles, 1 Kings chapter 17. 1 Kings chapter 17. Now, I was going to preach a different message this morning. In fact, I was going to preach uh, out of the book of Esther on a topic for such a time as this. Uh, really about the, really the culture that we face and, uh, again, the challenge that is before us, that we stand up for the living God. But God has been dealing with me about several things, and um, I'm going to end up sharing them with you out of a familiar story in the life of the prophet by the name of Elijah that we are introduced to in 1 Kings chapter 17. And we're going to be talking about the school by the brook or some lessons that we need to learn. Let me start in verse 1. And it says, And Elijah the Tishbite of the inhabitants of Gilead said to Ahab, Ahab being the king of the northern kingdom, and Elijah says this, As the Lord God of Israel lives, before whom I stand, there shall not be dew nor rain these years, except at my word. And then in verse 2, it goes, Then, after he does what God directed him to do, the word of the Lord came to him, came to Elijah, saying, Get away from here, turn eastward, and hide Brother Brook Cherith, which flows into the Jordan. And it will be that you shall drink of that brook, and I have commanded the ravens to feed you there. So he went, Elijah went, and did according to the word of the Lord, for he went and stayed by the brook Cherith, which flows into the Jordan. The ravens brought him bread and meat in the morning, bread and be meat in the evening, and he drank from the brook. And it happened after a while, the brook dried up, because there had been no rain in the land. Then, boy, I circle that word again, then, all right? He went where God instructed him to go. He stayed there for the time God instructed him to stay. Then, once the brook dried up, the word of the Lord came to him, saying, Arise, go to Zarephath, which belongs to Sidon, and there dwell. See, I have commanded a widow there to provide for you. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I pray this morning that you would take your word, dear Lord, and you would have it pierce our very hearts. Dear Lord, that we would understand the lessons, dear Lord, that you needed to instruct Elijah in for his life and for what he faced, dear Lord, in the coming days and in the coming years. Dear Lord, that we may learn these lessons, that we may stand, dear Lord, not in our own strength and our own wisdom, but in the strength of the Lord God that we may be able to give you the glory and honor so you so richly deserve. So bless this morning, dear Lord, as your word goes forth, for I pray in Jesus' name, amen. You know, Elijah, he's one of the men I, I love to read about in the word of God. He's one of the most uh, charismatic characters. Uh, the first time you introduced to him in 1 Kings chapter 70, verse 1, he appears out of nowhere, right? 
And this prophet, he ends up standing before the king of the northern kingdom, Ahab, and he declares, as the Lord God of Israel lives before whom I stand, there will not be dew nor rain these years except according to my word. And then if you know, again, about the history of Elijah, in 2 Kings chapter 2, he disappears from the scene as quickly as he appeared. All right, uh, in verse 11 it says, Suddenly a chariot of fire appeared with horses of fire, and Elijah went up by a whirlwind into heaven. All right, he's one of those that never faced death and went right into the presence of God. Now, Elijah was from a place, you heard me say, Gilead, that's east of the Jordan uh, River. Very wild, very rugged place. In fact, if you want to think about Elijah, think of John the Baptist. In fact, Elijah is believed historically wore a coat of coarse camel hair, had long hair, very muscular, very tough guy, all right? <laughs> I mean, you would not, uh, I wanted to meet him in a dark alley. In 1 Kings chapter 18, it says he even outran the horses of the royal chariot. But his real strength was not in himself. His real strength was founded in the fact that the Lord God was the supreme reality of his life. Now the word Elijah or his name Elijah can be translated Jehovah is my God or Jehovah is my strength. And that's really the key if you want to understand Elijah's ministry. All right, His key to his life and his ministry was living not in his strength. He was a strong guy. He was a powerful all right, man. But he did not live in his strength, but he lived in the strength of his God. But Elijah, like all men, he had to learn this, all right? And I believe it's a lesson all of us need to learn as we face this new year. Whatever challenges that we come against this year, whether it's in the culture, whether it's in our personal lives, we need to understand our strength to face those challenges do not come from some kind of ability or strength that we have within ourselves, but it comes from the Lord God. Now, in 1 Kings chapter 17, that I read those verses, we're introduced to two major events in his life, all right? The first event was in verse 1, he is instructed by God to confront the wicked king uh, Ahab. Ahab, if you know anything about him, he married uh, Jezebel. You don't find too many girls by the name of Jezebel, am I right? Because if you know the history of this woman, she was a daughter of Ethbal, the priest and king of Tyre and Sidon. And due to her influence, Ahab began to serve false gods, began to serve Baal and to worship him. In fact, Ahab set up an altar and a temple uh, to Baal in Samaria, which was the capital of the northern kingdom. And uh, Baal's worship, if you understand this, involved orgies, child sacrifices, because Baal was the god, the pagan god, of fertility and the forces of nature. In fact, why they were worshiping Baal was to ensure that they would have rain and that they would not experience drought and they would have crops enough to feed the people. But uh, Elijah's message, all right, in that verse 1, shows that God is always faithful to his what? His word. And uh, sin will be judged. In fact, back in the book of Deuteronomy chapter 11, when Moses was rehearsing the law, he told the people, Take heed, lest you turn aside and worship other gods, lest the Lord's anger be aroused and he shut up the heavens so that there will be no rain. And this is exactly what is happening. And it's kind of ironic when I was looking at this to think, Israel, the northern kingdom, is worshiping Baal in order to ensure that they would have rain. And God says, because you have forsaken me, you will have what? No rain. Now that's the first event. But the second event is Elijah's time beside this brook. All right? And it's going to be a place where God would school Elijah and prepare him for the ministry ahead. See, after the message was delivered to Ahab, I had to believe that Elijah was wondering, in other words, well, okay, we're going to have a drought. It means no rain, no dew, all right? It means the, the food resources are going to dwindle. Well, how am I going to live through this drought? But God had it all worked out. 
And we read the verses in verse 3 and 4. He said, you're going to go by the brook. You're going to have water there. And I'm going to instruct, what, ravens that they're going to feed you while you're there. And so, but you think about this. Elijah had gone to a palace. I mean, this, this muscular guy, this guy, man, in a coarse camel's hair and, I mean, long hair, rugged. And he declares, you know, before the king, this is what's going to happen. All right. And now all of a sudden God tells him, I want you to hide yourself by this brook. All right. The first scene, man, exciting, bold, action filled, man, just like, you know, one of those uh, superhero movies, right? But the second one is, man, he's going to go to a place that is out of the way, unnoticed, and a place that is quiet. A place where Elijah probably is going to be asking, am I in a holding pattern? But in reality, that brook was an essential part of God's plan for Elijah. It was a part of the plan that he would be able to learn some lessons, that he'd be able to stand in the days ahead for what God had for him. And it was by that brook, and we're going to look at this, that he learned four great truths that prepared him For chapter 18, when he stood on Mount Carmel and faced 850 false prophets alone and declared that he would call down fire from heaven, it was the lessons that he learned by that brook that gave him the strength and the faith to stand at that time. In fact, there was a pastor and evangelist, F.B. Meyer. Uh, I love this statement. He says, you must go to Cherith. Before you can stand on Mount Carmel. Before you're going to be able to face what comes in your life and what God has for you. And how he plans to use you. You need to learn some lessons in that obscure, quiet place by the brook. So what I want to do this morning, we're getting ready to face 2023. We're in it right now. I'm going to give you four lessons God's been dealing with me. All right. Lessons that I find, I mean, just hard. All right. For me. Uh, as an individual. And let me give them to you. Lesson number one. Elijah had to learn that his life, like all lives, must be lived one step at a time. I got to learn, you have to learn, that this year, before you, your life is going to be lived out one step at a time. This is what happens what he says in verse 2. Then the word of the Lord came to Elijah. See, before Elijah left for Samaria to deliver God's message, all right, before that, you know, when God told him you're going to go to, uh, go to Ahab and you're going to declare there'll be no rain, it probably would have been natural for Elijah to ask, well, you know, how is the king going to accept this? You know, I'm going in front of a king. The soldiers are there. And I'm going to declare... No rain, all right, unless I uh, declare that it will happen. Well, how is he going to respond? And, um, you know, what's going to happen to me, all right? Am I going to lose my life? What's going to be the final outcome of the message? Now, if Elijah asked those questions, and if he waited for a reply before he went, he would have never went at all. See, my tendency is, God says, here's what I want you to do. Well, let me ask you a couple questions, Lord. You know, if I do that, what then? You know, but how am I going to do that? What's going to happen? How are people going to respond? See, I'm going to play it safe. I want to have an exit strategy. Am I right? I'm going to have a strategy that's going to keep me, you know, comfortable and safe. But I'm saying if Elijah expected that, he would not have gone at all. And the truth that we must understand God will only show you and will only show me in this year before us one step at a time. And the problem of many of us, why we sang about anxiety, we get all anxious because we want to know the whole path before us. Well, God's not going to let you know the whole path. God's going to let you know one step at a time. Psalm 37 verse 23, it says, The Lord directs the steps of the godly. The Christian life is lived out, all right, one step at a time. And to refuse to step out is to forfeit 
the life that God has for you. But it's going to be one step at a time. And as soon as Elijah took the step where he was led, he says, okay, I'll go before the king, as dangerous as it is, and I'll declare that message. I will stand up for you in the midst of a pagan society that has rejected you, and I will declare your message, and he delivers that message, then what does verse 2 say? Then, and only then, the word of the Lord came to him. He didn't, did Elijah have to search for God's will? No. Not that I see. It came to him. And in fact, you see the truth again in verse 8. When the brook dried up, what does it say in verse 8? Then the word of the Lord came to him. Now, I don't know about you. Maybe I'm assuming you're going to be like me if I was sitting by that brook. And every day the water level became less and less and less. I'd be starting to think, well, you know what? I need a what? I need a plan. All right? And, and Bill's tendency would be to strike out on his own with his own plan. Very dangerous. All right? Elijah had to learn to stay right where he was until God directed him in the next step. And you see that truth there. And the surest way to stay in the will of God is to take life one step at a time. Now here's the question I was thinking. Maybe you're holding back in some area of your life as you enter this year because you don't know what the next step's going to be. You're afraid. Well, what happens if I do sell out to God? What happens if I, if I do what I believe God wants me to do? Well, what's going to happen? I'm saying that I need to learn the lesson. You need to learn the lesson to trust God and to take that step. And like Elijah, we will find out every time you put your foot forward in his will, God has prepared the next step. In fact, you see here, all right, and you got to remember, it, it, this man Elijah didn't know what was going on. All he knew, you go, you tell the king this message. And then after he declared the message, then God came to him, directed him to the brook. God had the next step, the place that Elijah needed, prepared for him before Elijah even took that step. You understand? In other words, God's not going to leave you in the lurch. It's not going to be, sometimes we get this idea, if I step out and do what God wants me to do, God's going to leave me out there by myself. I'm going to be vulnerable. He's, going to, he, he's just going to leave me. No. He has the steps already ordered, but he's just letting us know one step at a time. See, God's not going to tell us all that 2023 would hold. I couldn't handle it, and you couldn't handle it. I mean, you, I, I get overwhelmed what comes to me in one day anymore, let alone what would happen in 365 days. Am I right? He tells us just as much as we can handle at that moment, one step. And when we take that step, then he will direct us in the next step. And I believe in this way, Elijah and us, we learn the habits of what? Obedience and trust. You know what? There used to be an old song when I first got saved. This was 50 years ago. Trust and obey. There's no other way. And there's still no other way. But Elijah had to learn that. And sometimes when, you know, you, when you're, you're these strong personalities, am I right? You want to take your life in your own hands and you just want to strike out and you just want to do something, am I right? That's the type of guy Elijah was, and he had to learn one step, one step at a time. And sometimes that can be very difficult, but we need to learn that. Let me give you the second lesson. Elijah had to learn the value of a hidden life. Because what does he tell him in verse 3? He says, I want you to go by the brook, and he says, get away and hide yourself. All right? Hide yourself by the brook. You know, when one's life is to be used greatly by God, he has to learn to take a quiet place before God. You know, where we learn who our God is is not on those mountaintops. 
It's in the deepest valleys of our lives. See, Elijah had to learn that. D.L. Moody, a great evangelist in years gone by, said he could tell when a Christian was growing, he would elevate his Lord and talk less about what he was doing. And he would become smaller and smaller in his own esteem until the morning star, like the morning star, he faded away before the rising sun. That he saw who God is, who he was. And as, as he saw that, he became less and less in his own sight. See, there's no better way of doing that than by God suddenly dropping a man out of an area where he's beginning to think, I'm important. God needs me. This helps us to see how mixed sometimes our motives are, how insignificant our strength is. And how the reality is that, you know, you and I, we're not absolutely necessary to God's plan. You understand that, right? Christian minister once said this, and I love this quote I found. I was never of any use until I found out that God did not intend for me to be a great man. I was never any use to God until I realized that God never intended me to be a great man. See, it's possible to be too big for God to use you. But never too small for God to use you. We all must learn the truth. It's not by might. It's not by power. But it is by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. See, if I'm to see God's power in my life and to stand in the society that we find ourselves in, And again, if this ministry is to go forward in the way that God wants it to go forward as a witness, shining witness for him, all right, we have to discover by, you know, those quiet times by that brook, the way up truly is the way down, a place where we cast ourselves in utter dependence upon God. I have another quote by F.B. Meyer. Listen to this. It says, I used to think that God's gifts were on shelves one upon another. And the taller we grew, the easier it was to reach those gifts and be used of God. Now I find, he says, that God's gifts are on shelves one beneath another. And the lower I stoop, the more I get. Whoa. I think Jesus Christ is our ultimate example if you think about this. Listen to Philippians chapter 2, probably verses you're familiar with. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking upon himself the form of a bondservant, and coming in the likeness of men and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. Therefore God has also highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name, that the name of Jesus every knee shall bow, those in heaven, those on earth, those under the earth, and every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. See, even this lesson of the hidden life was a lesson that our Lord Learned in his early life. In fact, I I watched last night, I guess it was, Courtney, the third episode of The Chosen on this season. And it was showing, in other words, a scene where Jesus' earthly father, Joseph, was dealing with Jesus and teaching him scripture and instructing him. You understand if you read the word of God, it says Jesus grew in wisdom and stature. In order for him to relate to you and I, he put him in himself in a situation that he had to grow, all right, wisdom, physically, spiritually, and he experienced, all right, times in these quiet places where he found himself trusting and recommitting himself to God alone. You know, when I was thinking about this, the Lord found his cherith at Nazareth. 
where he grew up, in the wilderness of Judea where he was for all those days, and then by the trees of Bethany in the garden where so many times he retreated alone by himself. And what I'm saying that we all have to learn that, and it's hard. See, a man like Elijah, they don't want that. We don't want that. In fact, sometimes quietness alone just frightens us. And God's taking this man who was, you know, right one minute before Ahab, and now he's putting him alone by himself. Now think about that. 24 hours a day, seven days a week, alone. Just sitting, communing with God, all right? Not knowing what the next step would be. And what I'm saying, we should not run from those places. And when God allows us to have those times, it's not a wasted time, all right? And we need to seek those times. We need to learn the value of hidden life. But also, let me give you a third lesson. Elijah had to learn to trust God absolutely. To trust God absolutely. That's why you read in verse 4, 5, and 6. It says, go by the brook and ravens are going to feed you. See, Elijah's life was in danger. Am I right? Ahab is going to be seeking after him. And God reassures the prophet, I will protect you. I will care for you. You go by the brook that flows into the Jordan. You're going to drink from that brook and I've commanded ravens to feed you. A little strange, all right? I wrote down a couple things here. God sent Elijah to a brook that's going to be subject to what? The drought. There's a drought coming, all right? And you're putting me by a brook, a little brook, all right? I mean, it doesn't make much sense. Also, if I'm going to be hiding from Ahab, wouldn't it be better to get out of the country instead of stay in the country and how about you I mean just to even think about nature ravens are unclean animals according to mosaic law and this meant this meant you know even if elijah wanted to change his diet one day and say you know i want roast raven he couldn't do it he couldn't eat them right he had to end up be satisfied with what god gave him from those ravens and by the way if you know about ravens ravens neglect they're young. Elijah, my question, why in the world's God using something or someone that really is unreliable? But by the way, they did not fail to feed Elijah two times every day that he was by that brook. And I wrote down a great truth as we face 2023. Our God is not limited by the circumstances of my life. I don't know what your what's going on in your life. You don't know really all the circumstances of my life. But God's not limited by those circumstances. See, I have a God who is Lord over the circumstances. That's what we sung about when we said that Jesus reigns. And you notice the strong emphasis when you read these verses in verse 4. When he ends up saying, and it will be that you'll drink from that brook that I have commanded the ravens to feed you. And the last word in the, that verse is there. If you're there, if you're where I command you to be, I will be faithful and your every need will be met. Elijah might have preferred me. I, have, I know, you know a lot of other places I could hide. But this was the only place where those ravens were going to supply him. And that means that as we start this year, I got to ask, Am I where God wants me to be? If not, I need to get there, all right, in that place and to trust him absolutely. 1 Corinthians 2, 3 says that your faith might rest in the wisdom, not rest in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Elijah, this mighty man, this, this you know, tough guy, had to learn I can trust God absolutely. When I don't even know what's going on. But the hardest lesson I believe is the fourth one. Where Elijah had to learn to sit by a drying brook. 
See, just when Elijah, and, 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 and this is how I would be. If you're there the first day, okay, you're a little apprehensive, but you're, the water's there, the ravens are coming. But after 30 days, I mean, I, I've done this. I mean, the ravens are coming, the water's there. I, I just don't even think about it, all right? And it ends up that I just assume everything is going to just keep on going the same way. But in verse 7, it says, the brook started to dry up. Now, see, I would notice that. <laughs> I would be, uh-oh, Lord, are you, the spigot is, <laughs> I mean, something's going, do you, and, and I'd be praying, Lord, you see this, you know what you need to do, right? In other words, but that's when God would, you know, put him in this situation, and God's using it to meet his need. And he just says, sit still. Oh, sit still. My, anybody ever say, my life's falling apart. Sit still. Oh, I got to do something. I got to say something. I got to take things in my hands. Am I right? And God's telling Elijah, sit still. And he's the type of guy, he's a triple A personality. <laughs> See, I mean, Diane's been trying 57 years to tell Bill to sit still. Bill can't, I can't even sit, all right, let alone sit still. I don't know how Elijah even did this by the brook, all right. Man, I do something, I don't need, I probably wasn't even hating any fish in that brook, right? I mean, think about it, just sitting there, right? Hard to do. What did Elijah think during this time? Did God forget me? I would be thinking I need to do something, all right? <clears throat> the danger is to see the brook drying up, <clears throat> we're tempted Take things in our own hands, not being satisfied where God has put us. I'm, I'm 76 years old. I can tell you about times Bill's taken life in his own hands. It doesn't work out well, all right? doesn't work out well. See, many of us, I believe, in this new year, you're going to be called and I'm going to be called to sit by some drying brooks, <clears throat> drying brooks of health, where our health I mean, it's just not what it was. And all of a sudden, I mean, it seems like, Lord, you see what's going on in my body. Drying brook of money. Don't have the resources. I, I need certain things. Drying brook of relationships. Whether it's marriage, whether it's your kids. But sometimes you're going to be by these drying brooks. Just like Elijah was. But there's always a reason. Why did God do this? You know, God could have kept that brook flowing. Am I right? I wrote down a couple things. He had to teach Elijah that his sufficiency was not in that brook. His sufficiency was in his God. See, and I, I have to constantly learn. My sufficiency is not as I, Bill has this mind, man, I can manipulate things, do things, get things to work out, whether business or whatever. My sufficiency is not in me being able to handle everything. My sufficiency is in God and Him alone. Hard lesson to learn. For months, while the brook is drying up, Elijah had to settle down to breakfast and dinner delivered each day, and he had plenty of water to drink. And then finally came the day when the brook was dried up. But God did not forget him. All right? See, when we have nothing left but God, then all of a sudden we realize he's enough. If I have him, I have enough. 2 Corinthians 3, 5. Not that we are sufficient in ourselves to claim anything comes from us, but our sufficiency is in God. My sufficiency is not in a job. My sufficiency is not in my health. My sufficiency is not that everything's going to work out a certain way. My sufficiency is in him. See, Elijah is this type of guy. He relies on himself. You know, it ends up in a lot of, I know men are that way. That's how I relate. He had to learn, guess what? Your sufficiency is not what you can do. Your sufficiency is in me. But also, Elijah had to be prepared for future trials. See, this was just going to be the beginning. See, and, and Elijah, he didn't know this, right? 
And so this is going to be the beginning of a series of crises in his life. And here, here, here's a good thought, right? 2023, you could go through a series of crises, right? Not just one. Doesn't the Psalms talk about that many times? David said it seemed like the troubles that came to me were like bills. You go down to the ocean, a wave knock you down. You get up, another wave knock you down. Well, God's preparing Elijah because he's going to face some difficult situations, all right? Because right after this, he's going to meet a widow, if you look in chapter 17, verse 12, who is ready to die, just has a little bit of meal and oil. She's making one little cake for herself and son, and then they're going to lie down their beds and die. And God tells Elijah, you come to this woman who has nothing, and you tell her, well, you make that cake and you give it to me. And if you give it to me and eat, and I'll eat it, then you'll go back and you'll check, and you're going to have enough meal and oil to supply you for the rest of your life. What? How does that work? Am I right? He had to trust God for that. Then how about you go a little bit later in chapter 17, the son dies. And the woman, I mean, you can imagine her response, right? And Elijah's confused. He don't know what is going on. And he's told to bring the boy back to life. Bring, think about that. <laughs> back to life? All right? I mean, I can stare, I, I can stare down a king and bell, you know, in front of him, but you know, to call back life. And then uh, Mount Carmel in chapter 18, he's going to stand on Mount Carmel before 850 false prophets. And he's going to tell them that we're going to have a little contest here, <laughs> all right? We're going to see who is the Lord God. We're going to end up called down fire from heaven. We're going to make sacrifice on an altar, but we're not going to light it. We're going to call down fire from heaven. Whoa. And he's going, this is what God told him to do. I'm, I'm in this series of crises. Elijah had to learn to look to God, not the crisis. See, here's my problem many times. It's... I have ADD. I, I just get distracted. In other words, I really want to look to God and trust Him. But then something comes in my life and I'm like, whoo. I'm like that, you know, I used to hear an old preacher years ago when I was a young man was talking about down south when they would end up have hunting dogs and they would hunt, you know, raccoons and they would end up, you know, tree them and, you know, to get them. And he said that you would train your dogs but some dogs you couldn't train because when they'd be following the trail, that raccoon, if a rabbit crossed that trail, immediately the dog would go after the what? That's Bill. <laughs> right? And, but that's a lot of us. We just, we're heading in the right direction. Something happens. Woo, I'm, I'm somewhere else. Elijah had to learn in the midst of Christ. Don't look at that crisis. Look at me. There's going to be some things going to happen, I believe, in the world in which we live, the side in which we live, it's going to scare us. And um, we need to understand, you know what? We sang it. The Lord God reigns. He's my sufficiency. He had to, Elijah had to learn that. I have to learn that. The third lesson that I wrote down here, he teaches us that by those brooks, that the true meaning of our life is in him, not what we do for him. You ever think about this? What can you do for God who created this world and hung the stars in space? What can I do to impress God that God's going, whoa, Bill, man, that's good. That's great. I need to realize the meaning of my life is in him and his relationship. So here's what I'm thinking, and it's things that I've been going through, all right, as I'm going to be stepping out doing a mission trip again uh, this year and some other things. Today, as you face an uncertain year, I gotta, you and I need to learn to trust God one step at a time. You know what? Just what, what does God want me to do today? One step at a time. I need to learn the value of a hidden life. In fact, a lot of the verses I've been memorizing have been talking about being quiet. Isaiah 30, verse 15 says, In quietness and confidence shall be your strength. Bill, just quiet, confidence, trust me. That will be your strength. Then learn to trust him absolutely. 
Psalm 18, 1, another one of my verses, the Lord is my rock, my fortress, and my deliverer, my God, my strength, in whom I will trust. Maybe this morning, already in this year, you're facing a brook that's drying up, and you don't see no ravens coming. You don't see how God is going to be able to correct that situation or to meet that need. And what I'm saying, like Elijah, we need to understand and learn that God is our sufficiency one day at a time, one meal at a time. And we turn our need over to the Lord and trust him. May not use ravens, may not use a brook, but somehow, some way, he will meet your need. And understand there's a reason. Because I believe he's preparing us, his people, to give him honor and glory as we are left here to declare his name. Let's have every head bowed and every eye closed. Nobody looking around. Maybe you're here this morning and you can associate with what I'm saying concerning about Elijah. Maybe it's you're one of those quiet places by the brook and the brook is drying up. Maybe it's learning to go one step at a time, whatever it is. But this morning, you need to recommit yourself to the Lord, saying, Lord, I'm going to commit myself to follow you one step at a time. And even though I don't understand, even though I can't see what you are doing, I'm going to trust you completely. We're going to give you the opportunity. We're going to we're into a new year. I'm going to give you the opportunity to come to this altar and you can yield yourself as a living sacrifice to God and say, here I am to do your will. If it's to stand up, if it's to sit down and be quiet, but whatever you would have me to do, here am I. And that you would commit yourself to him, that you will trust him no matter what you're facing in life. I wonder if everyone would stand, heads bowed, eyes closed, nobody looking around. We want to do as Pastor Matt does every service. We want to give you this opportunity to come to this altar. What better place to start a new year than on your knees before God, yielding yourself a living sacrifice to Him.